This is what I usually wear on a Saturday morning because I'm usually in my colonies right now. Even though beekeepers walk around in what looks like a biohazard suit, um, most of us prefer to go unnoticed. And there's a small group of beekeepers, migratory beekeepers, that certainly go unnoticed by most of us, and I'm excited to be here today to tell you about them. But first, some background. The honeybee in that picture is pollinating an almond blossom. Now, almond pollen is very heavy, so it can't be transmitted by the wind, like corn or rice or wheat. So it must be carried flower by flower by these foragers. To any casual observer who's read the newspaper in the last five or six years, you understand that bees are in trouble. Bees are arguably a sentinel species, so if bees are in trouble, we're in trouble. As a matter of fact, in the last 60 years, we've lost over 50% of our colonies in the United States. We still don't know what's killing them, and it is taking far longer than we ever anticipated and is much more difficult than we ever imagined. Over the last seven years, we've reported a loss of 30% of our colonies through the winter every year, despite political party. But this is a story of hope but it's a story of hope with a clear realization that we cannot fail. And this is a story of these beekeepers, these migratory beekeepers that are the gatekeepers of our food supply. Well, these beekeepers, these, these migratory beekeepers are our unsung heroes, at least my unsung heroes. And this, this journey starts in the fall as they move across the West to the San Joaquin Valley with their 1.5 million colonies to pollinate almonds. They must start their preparations well before the fall, and in doing so, the first thing they must do is treat for varroa mites. Now, varroa mites are a horrible ectoparasite that were accidentally introduced in the United States in the 1980s and for, has forever changed the way that we, we manage colonies. I think there's, there's a time period in beekeeping that's BV and AV, before varroa and after varroa. Um, it has had the largest economic impact on beekeeping in the United States, and more bees have died because of this mite than any pest or pathogen. So the challenge for the beekeepers is to treat for these varroa mites, but you're putting a miticide in with an insect. So you're trying to kill a mite on an insect, which is a very difficult balance because you can't hurt the bees. Bees liken varroa mite to Satan. And as you can tell, when they discovered this mite, it was given perhaps the most nefarious, wicked, scientific name ever, de varroa destructor. And that's exactly what it does. It vectors viruses into the honeybee while feeding off its blood. And you can see the mite in the, the center bee there. It, it's quite large. Now, after the migratory beekeepers treat their hives for uh, varroa mites, it's now the fall and the winter, and there is no forage. There's no natural forage. There's no flowers blooming. There's no trees blooming. So they must feed them. And what they give them is sugar syrup, and you can see this beekeeper putting it in like a, a trough-like frame inside the colony. And that takes the place of what would be naturally nectar for the honeybee, and that's their carbohydrates. They must also give them a protein supplement, which takes the place of natural pollen. So now these beekeepers have treated, they fed, if they live in the north, they have to get the bees out before snowfall, and they have to move them before the pallets freeze to the ground. As a matter of fact, some beekeepers even move their colonies to potato sheds in Idaho before they move them to almonds. Now, darkness. Be bees won't fly if it's less than 50 degrees. They won't fly if it's raining or if it's cloudy. They won't fly if it's much, the wind's much larger than 25 miles an hour. But most importantly, they do not fly when it's dark. So these migratory beekeepers load their colonies in the dark, in the cold. Now I'm gonna show you loading them. It's, it's a daytime picture because you wouldn't see much of a forklift in the dark. Um, <laughs> so four to a pallet, 400 to a truck, and they do this by forklifts. And watching how fast and how skillfully they use, they use these forklifts to load these honey colonies, it reminded me of a ballet where the dancer is this elegant machine, lifting, and pirouetting, and, and spinning, but without an audience, except for the honeybee. Okay, you've treated, you've fed, you've loaded. You must cover the bees with a tarp and strap them down. But this tarp is not 
like every other tarp like you'd go buy at Home Depot or Lowe's. This tarp has to be breathable, right? Because you have live animals inside. So these beekeepers, remind, they're, they're like the MacGyvers of beekeepers. They, they will modify and adjust to make their job more efficient and more foolproof because beekeeping is anything but that. So they make these tarps out of patio, fabric, patio furniture fabric because it's in incredibly durable. You put the strap on, you notice every strap on that on, over those colonies has a half twist to it. And, and for anybody who's loaded a kayak on, or uh, luggage on the top of a car, that half twist is, ne is really necessary. For those of you who want the scientific viewpoint, the half twist um, forces the vortex shedding frequencies caused by the wind to occur off phase. Okay, what does that mean for the rest of us? It, it causes the, the strap to not flap. So it will not flap. Because if that strap flapped, it would immediately tear a hole in that tarp and actually punch through those wooden hives. So these, you know, they say, what is it? Um, experience comes from mistakes and mistakes come from experience. This is what you learn. Okay, San Joaquin Valley. The San Joaquin Valley lies south of Sacramento and north of Los Angeles and is one of the most productive farmlands in the country. The almond pollination represents the largest managed pollination event in the world. And the economic value far eclipses the California wine and grape industry combined. Between November and February of every year, 3,000 to 6,000 truckloads of honeybees enter the state of California. There are 810,000 acres of almonds in California, larger than the state of Rhode Island. And thanks to the honeybee, this year they produced over 1.85 billion pounds of almonds. So let's continue on our journey. Pollination colonies are very limited. It, they're, they're scarce, and so we're willing to pay a lot of money for them. As a matter of fact, between 2004 and 2010, we actually imported Australian honeybees on 747 jumbo jets so that they can come from their spring, because remember Australia, Southern Hemisphere, their spring to our winter to work alongside the honeybees. Now, our borders are closed to Australia because they have, uh, they're close to them now because they have a, uh, an exotic bee species, an exotic mite that we don't have. But for a time, they worked alongside the United States honeybees. So you've treated, you've fed, you've loaded, you've tarped. You've kissed them on the head and sent them 3,000 miles across the country to the San Joaquin Valley. If your driver doesn't fall asleep at the wheel, if the bees don't overheat and die on the truck, and if the truck doesn't go off the road, eventually you'll make it to one of 16 California border stations. How many people even knew there were border stations in California? Okay, we have a few, great. So beekeepers jokingly say that if you're bringing a load of bees into California, it's like entering another country and you almost need a passport. Because California produces billions of dollars of, of farm products, they're very strict about what comes into their, their state. So if you arrive and one of the border agents finds something on your truck or your pallets that they, don't, they can't identify, they actually take a picture of it, send it to Sacramento. Meanwhile, you wait, your bees wait in the heat, and then they come back. If they find something they don't like, say the fire ant, they will send you to another border station where they will hose down your truck and your pallets, all at a cost to you. And for this, you're paid the princely sum of $150 to $200 a colony. Now, if you get to California too early, the almond blooms around the Valentine's Day, um, if you get there early, say in October, November, December, likely your bees will go into what are called holding yards. And they're there with thousands and thousands of other colonies from across the country. And because, we remember, we talked, the pollination prices are so high that these holding yards present a very strong temptation for, let's say, the, the wranglers out west. So sometimes in the middle of the night, Trucks will appear, colonies will disappear, and reappear in other almond orchards. And unfortunately, some, most of these colonies are never recovered. Okay, you're in, you're in the almond blossoms. You've loaded them, unloaded them, on a pallet, in the dark. And at this point, when the almond, blossom, almond bloom happens, everybody tracks the honeybee flight hours closer than planes coming into LAX airport. Because remember, bees don't fly in the dark, they don't fly in the cold, and they don't fly in the rain. So every hour that the bees can fly means more almonds. 
What happens in the next few weeks determines the, the almond crop, and entire operating expenses are recovered in this very short time. So now the bloom is over, but you can't move your hives until the field manager declares what is poetically called petal fall. And this is actually a very beautiful time to be in the orchards, and I'd highly recommend um, everybody viewing that once. So you leave the almond orchards, and now you go to your next migratory contract. And I won't go through this whole map, but you can see there's a lot. Um, but there's one migratory route that I want to pay particular attention to, and that's along the East Coast. And these are the beekeepers who pollinate blueberries, cranberries, pumpkins, apples. And in the study we just released this year, we have found that following the bloom is a lot more hazardous than we thought. And in, in this case, we followed beekeepers we collected pollen while they were in these pollination yards, and then we fed the pollen to healthy caged bees. And the pollen that contained fungicides that we fed to the bees, we found were three times more likely to come, to be, to come down with a gut parasite called nozema. As a matter of fact, another ongoing study that we've done for the last two years where we collected pollen from colonies across 34 states in the United States, and, and, and we analyzed it for pesticides. And in fact, the largest pesticide we found in the colonies are actually the miticides bees put in the colonies to protect them from varroa mites. However, the second pre most prevalent pesticide were again fungicides, which are not designed. No one's ever thought that they would harm honeybees. Okay, bees need forage. Forage is their food. The Conservation Reserve Program is a, pro is a voluntary program where the government pays farmers to set aside environmentally sensitive land. And this is to protect wildlife, conserve soil, improve the water quality. But just this year, the USDA released a report saying that 400, over 400,000 acres were taken out of grasslands and forests and converted to croplands because of the lucrative price of corn and soybean. Why do we care? Because bees need forage. What I'm going to show you next, I think, will convince you that, that we all can make a difference. You know, we can't influence how many acres of corn are out there, but there is something very discreet in our home that we can make a change. Now, monoculture is, is, is kind of a divisive word, um, but it's, 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 uh, it's, we think of monoculture as corn or soybeans or alfalfa, but again, what I'm going to show you here, the largest irrigated crop in the United States that far eclipses any of the top seven crops that we consider as monoculture, that's corn, alfalfa, soybeans, your vineyards, your nut trees, and cotton. The largest crop are our lawns. I want to make an appeal, a humble appeal for the dandelion. It's a beautiful flower. <laughs> it's a beautiful flower. Bees love it. You get it naturally. You don't have to plant it. It will come if you stop applying <laughs> pesticides. Um, Think about not watering your lawns. 30% of our household water budget goes to keeping our lawns green. Think about not applying pesticides and fungicides. Think about reducing your mowing. Over 17 million gallons of gas are spilled every year just filling up our lawn mowers. Now, I'm a mother of three, so my skill set includes nagging. <laughs> um, but if you, if you refine the art of nagging, the other person will be urgently compelled to do what you want to do, and they won't even know why. <laughs> so if you leave here with the urge to go and rent a rototiller and plow up your front yard or your side yard or your backyard, then I've done my job. If you leave here with a greater understanding of what these 1,500 men and women do to put food on our tables, then I have done my job. And if you've made the decision that I'm not going to put pesticides or fungicides in my lawn, and you convinced your neighbor to your left and your neighbor to your right, then you're better at nagging than I am. <laughs> um, I think we all can do it, and I think we want to do it. I believe there's a little bit of hero in all of us. Thank you.